Well, if you've got your Bibles, you can pull those out to John chapter 11 is where we're going to be. If you've got your message notes, you can pull those out and follow along, kiddos. We've given you some message notes and some crayons. And there's some places on there where you can listen to Brother Wes. And you can check out, check what words that I've said. You can write your scripture down. You can do a crossword puzzle. There's all kind of little activities there. So I encourage you guys to just draw and, and write away and listen and tell mom and dad what the sermon's about. Because they probably won't listen. So you just tell them, okay? Uh, and, um, and, and so, and I think the, the notes are on my, our phone too. So we're excited to, um, to, to, to share this with you today. We're going to be, re, be reading in John chapter 11, verse 25. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Jesus said, this is who I am. I'm going to describe myself to you. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I don't know how you describe yourself, but I'm pretty sure you wouldn't say, hey, bro, I am the resurrection and the life. You may say, I'm tall. I'm from seminary. I'm from Colin. I don't know how you describe yourself, but I'm pretty sure nobody in this room is going to describe themselves as, hey, I am the resurrection and the life because he is the only one that can do that. Well, what is the resurrection? The resurrection is when dead things come back to life. It's when something that is dead comes back to life. In college, I had a resurrecting goldfish. This goldfish was like a bug-eyed, one of those black, boogle-eyed, you know, goldfish. And every morning, I'd wake up, and that sucker would be belly up. And I'd go in there, get me some breakfast, come back in, going to flush him down the toilet. He'd be swimming around. About 30 times he did that. Last time, I said, I ain't even going to get him. He just decayed in there. I just left him in there. Come on, somebody. Resurrecting goldfish. This may be one to know that. Um, Tough crowd this morning. Y'all, did y'all get your coffee? All right, just making sure, just making sure. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And like I said the last four, three weeks, it's important to read Scripture in context. You can make the Bible say anything you want it to say if you just take one or two verses and put them together. But it's important that we read the Bible in context. So this, John chapter 11, verse 25, is said within a story... And I want to read that story to you this morning on Easter Sunday, 2018. And hopefully it'll speak to you. It's in John chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. The story of Lazarus. Maybe you're familiar with that story. Lazarus. Um, it says in verse number 1 of John chapter 11, A man whose name was Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters Mary and Martha. And this is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet, wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Hey, Lord, your, your dear friend is very sick. And like he's very sick. He, he don't just have pneumonia. He don't just have the flu. He's terminally ill. And it's not like he's going to die. It's not like the stomach virus where you think you're going to die, but you don't die. And you wish you could die, but you don't. It's like he is going to die, Jesus. You need to do something. And so he goes to verse 4. Come on, Jesus, you need to do something. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. So don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's not, but Jesus, you don't understand. He's fixing to die. If, we, if you've ever been in that situation, if you don't do something, you, something bad's going to happen. He said, no, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory. And if you read the rest of the story... Verses 5 through 14, Jesus not only waits a few minutes, not only waits a couple hours, he waits two more days and the brother dies. Lazarus dies and everybody falls out and everybody thinks it's over. It's over. Death has come. They hit a dead end. They hit a dead end. Have you ever hit a dead end in your life? Have you ever been going along in life and everything's good and then all of a sudden the road is no more? There's no more direction. I love to go preach at other churches and I do that quite a bit and just to, to, I just love to preach. The Lord's called me to preach. I love to preach and that just kind of works out good together. And I get, uh, I always get called to country churches because I'm a country preacher. I, I never have like a city person call me and say, Brother West, would you like to come and preach at our church? No, nobody's ever said that. They say, hey, you don't come preach for us? Lay it down there. <laughs> I, I preached one time the, where the, literally it, the, the, the church was on the end of a red gravel road. It was, there was no pavement. 
I preached at a church one time that was a barn church. It was like a cowboy church. Anybody ever been to cowboy church? It was a cowboy church, and it was in a barn. And it wasn't like some wedding, like, venue where they have barn. That ain't a barn. Like, they run the cows out of there that morning, throw some hay on the ground, say, come on, preach, preach. We cowboys. Some of them rode their horses to church. So I preached in a lot of different places. I'm, I've never preached at this place before I was going to, and so I put it in my GPS. I put my little GPS up there, and I preach while I drive. And I'm just driving along. If you see me, if you pass me, and like I'm yelling or something, I'm preaching. Some of the best sermons I've ever preached have been in my truck. I preach a lot better in my truck than I do out here. I preach so good in my truck, sometimes I want to take an offering. <laughs> but then I realize I'm the only one in the truck. <laughs> I'm preaching, I'm preaching, I'm preaching. And I'm, re- I'm about on the second point. I'm laying the hammer down. And all of a sudden, I notice that the road narrows significantly. It's like... I'm on a single lane, blacktop road. If somebody comes, I'm going to have to pull off to the side, let them by. It it has gotten, and I check my GPS, and we still headed in the right direction. It's telling me, so I'm going in the right direction. So I keep on driving, keep on driving. I come to a community. It's a community in the woods. It's a community in the woods. I I noticed, first of all, they have a lot of cars in their yard. Now, if you have a lot of cars in your yard, I'm not talking about you. This may be somebody you can to, but there was a lot of cars in the yard. These cars were, didn't have wheels. They were up on blocks. They had been there for a while. Had trees growing up through them. They didn't need to go to Napa. Didn't need to go to AutoZone. Just go out there in the front yard. We got to part on that thing right there, that Chevy. It's just, let's just walk out there. Th- there were dogs all over. Dogs all over. These were not purebred dogs. These were mixed dogs. That means your dog got over in my yard, and now we got more dogs. And the youngins was running. If I'm lining them down, they're running, and they're playing with the dogs in their underwear. The dogs and the youngins are playing in the yard, and the people are just kind of staring at me. It's kind of like their hat. It's like way up on their head. You've seen them people that wear that, wear that hat way up on their head, and they're watching me as I go by, and I can hear banjo music playing. <laughs> I'm checking my GPS. You've been there. Checking my GPS, what in the world, where am I at? And I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, the road just ends. It's like the people building the road said, we've gone far enough. It's over. We're not building no more road. They just stopped, had a big old dead end. I checked my GPS. The GPS is still going. It's like, keep going forward, keep going forward, keep going forward. I'm like, them little Apple cars I've been seeing out there in Collins, they didn't go down this road. They said, we're going to guess at it. It's going to be a good, just go for it. And I'm sitting there at the end of the road. And so I call the pastor of this church that I'm going to. And he's one of these Holy Ghost pastors. You know what I'm talking about? One of those that can make seven syllables out of one word. It's like, God, <laughs> Jesus. I, just, I wonder how the dude orders it Sonic. I really do. I'm like, I want a number one with tater tots and chili. And some sweet tea on top of that. Come on, bring it on to my... I'm like, come on, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a break, man. <laughs> so I called him up. He said, <laughs> I said, he said, hey, brother, we can't wait to have you for our services today. It's going to be a Holy Ghost filled service. We just can't wait to have you. Uh, uh, where, where are you at? I said, I'm sitting at the end of a road that has ended. Like it's no more road. Do you know where I'm at? Oh, brother, you have missed the turn. You have missed the turn. You need to back up about four knots and there is a road to the right. You just need to turn in the, our little church is down the road. So I backed up. And I'm like, where are these people at that I just seen a while ago? Because I know like they have live in the trees or something. And I'm backing up. And if you ever went into like a hunting camp where like the trees have grown over the road. And like when you pull in, the trees hit your truck. They hit my truck when I pulled in. And at the end of this road, there was a little wood frame church. And I'm pulling up to that church. And I'm thinking to myself, they have snakes in this church. They will bring out a snake on you in this church. I've never seen this pastor before. I've listened to, th- th- here comes the snake. Here comes the rattle. And I'm like Wendy Bagwell. If you bring a rattlesnake out here, the Lord has not called me to pick up no serpent. I'm out. You will not get a ser- sermon today. People say, do y'all handle snakes at the springs? No. We do not have the faith. We may bring out a reptile every now and then. <laughs> I pull up to this church and the pastor come out. You know the type. He's got his suit on. He's got a Bible this thick. He walks up to me. He said, brother, we've been praying for you. We can't wait to have you. We're going to have a great service today. I said, do you know there are people back there that will kill you? (laughs) If I'm lying, I'm dying. He says, they won't kill you. They just kill each other. Come on, let's have a good church service. I was like, and you're okay with that? You're okay with that? 
Have you ever been going down a road that you thought was going somewhere and it just ended? Maybe it was a relationship. Maybe you started out in this relationship and it was wonderful and you had dreams and aspirations of this relationship of it going somewhere and all of a sudden you're looking at the, and, you, and the road just stopped and it's over. Maybe you got your degree. Maybe you've got this career that you've called into and I'm going to be successful at this career and all of a sudden maybe addiction slips in or maybe some, something, a bad decision slips in and you're sitting at the dead end. You, has anybody ever been at a dead end? Has everybody been there when the doctor walked in and said, hey, this is what's happening? Everybody been there when the, when the financial person walks in and said, this is the dead end? I'm so glad if you've ever been at a dead end, you're here this morning because we serve a God who knows about dead ends. In this story, they've reached a dead end. Lazarus is dead. And the time I have with you this morning, I want to I point out four dead ends that maybe you can identify with, and hopefully it'll help you this Easter. The first dead end I see is found in a guy by the name of Thomas. Thomas. Verse 16. Thomas is at the dead end of doubt. He's at the dead end of doubt. Have you ever reached a point in your life where you doubted and you couldn't make yourself believe? You couldn't make yourself believe. It says in verse 16 that Thomas, who is nicknamed the twin, some of your Bibles say, may say Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and let's die with Jesus. Let's just die with Jesus. In other words, he's saying, hey, he let Lazarus die. And last time we was in Judea, they was going to kill us. So I tell you what, why don't we all go to Judea and die together? Doesn't that sound great? And that's what Thomas was saying. Jesus was going in faith. Thomas was going in doubt. Have you ever doubted? Has you ever, have you ever heard me preach something up here or heard some other preach, preacher preach something up here? And you're like, you know what? That's good, but I don't believe it. You're sitting out there. Amen, amen. Yep, in your in your heart, because you know y'all amen in your heart. You know it just never comes out your mouth. Just amen, but you don't believe it. Have you ever been to the dead end of doubt, where you wanted to believe something so bad, but you just didn't know where else to go? I think some of us understand what the dead end of doubt is. The second dead end I see in this story is found in Mary, and Mary is at the dead end of discouragement. You ever been discouraged? Didn't want to try anymore. Kept trying and things didn't turn out the way they should have. At the dead end of discouragement. Mary was at that dead end. It says in verse 20 of this story, When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, what did Martha do? Martha went to meet him. But what did Mary do? Mary just stayed in the house. Have you ever been so discouraged that you, say, you said to yourself, I'm just going to stay in the house. No use to go outside today. No use to try today. I, there's just not going to work. She had hit the dead end of discouragement. The dead end of discouragement. Pastor, we've tried 70 times and we've lost 70 times. There's no use to try 71. That we've, we've, I'm always going to be depressed. There's marriage is never going to be anything. It's never it's this dead end job. You're at the dead end of discouragement. Work. The third dead end. You're at the dead end of delay. I think a lot of people get at this dead end because God's timing and your timing aren't the same. We serve a crockpot God and we're a microwave generation. We want it in five minutes and God says it's in my time. It says in verse 17, When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Isn't this funny that they don't think Jesus knows that? Hey, did you know Lazarus is dead? Yes, I am the son of God. And I was here when the creation was created. But thank you for telling me. And he's been dead four days. Not three, but four. Why four days? It's important. A little Bibleology here. For three days in this culture, they felt like the spirit of a person hovered over them. And after the fourth day, they felt like the spirit left. So this person, Lazarus, was really dead. In their opinion. To quote the Princess Bride, he was dead dead. <laughs> Nobody's watched that show. We've got to watch that show in our church. Nobody's watched that show all, all week. This guy's dead, okay? And we get to verse 20. 
And verse 21 says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. If you had only been here, God, I think we all can relate to asking God why. I think we can all relate to saying, God, I don't understand. I don't think you need to fake it with God, if I may say this. I think you need to be real with God because God's big enough to handle your real, real questions. I can't answer them, but God can. And, and Martha's at a dead end. She's at the dead end of delay. And I, I know there's some people here that you're waiting on God and he hadn't done nothing yet. I know that. And you're at a dead end. The fourth dead end. It's kind of morbid, but it's true. It's the dead end of death. The dead end of death. And every person in this room will hit this dead end at some point in your life. You will reach this point. One out of one people die. Lazarus did it twice. Can you imagine Lazarus, that conversation with Jesus? Am I going to have to do this again, Lord? The dead end of death. Death is a reality. Death, death is a reality. 56 million people die each year. 56 million. They say there's about 7.5 billion people on the planet. 56 million people die a year. 550,000 of those people die in car accidents. And can I tell you that probably all 550,000 of those didn't wake up that morning and say, you know what, today is a good day to die in a car accident. Five million people die of cancer every year. And I guarantee not one single person wakes up and said, you know what, this year I will get cancer and I will die. But death is a reality. That's the reason Easter is so stinking important. Because we're all going to reach the dead end of death. I've seen more death than I ever want to see in my life. I've stood in funerals and stood in hospital rooms and stood in rooms where people have left this earth. And I'm telling you, death is real. You don't have to watch TV about how somebody died and how, how they dissect them and all that stuff. You ain't got to watch all that. It's real. I was standing at a funeral home the other day, and this godly man had passed away and just lived a life of faith, you know. And those funerals are horribly wonderful. That's what I call them. They're horribly wonderful. Then you know where they are. And, and I'm standing there at this, this casket, and the family's going by. I noticed right at the front of the, 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 the casket, the casket, the, the, the flowers say, pop, pop. We love you, pop, pop. And, and I, I thought, well, the grandchildren have got him these flowers. You know, Pop Pop is gone. And they, we're at that final view. And it's me and the funeral director and all the families passing by. And this beautiful elderly lady who's been his wife for 60 years passes by. And she pats him on his hand, kisses him on his head, and walks away. And I'm standing there with the funeral director. And the funeral director takes closes the casket and I think to myself is that all there is I mean 60 years 60 years pouring your life into somebody for 60 years and a pat on the hand a kiss on the forehead and walk away that's what Easter's about because death hit a dead end at the casket it can't go any further than the casket death ends at the grave Death can't follow you any further than that. Look at what it says. And I'm about to preach myself happy. Y'all better watch out. Verse 43. <laughs> I know I wear, wore khakis today. And you thought, Brother West is going to preach an intellectual message today. You, you got that wrong. You messed up. Verse 43. When, G, when he had said this, Jesus called with a loud voice. Hey, Lazarus, come out. One of my love these next four words, five words. The dead man came out. <laughs> Come on. His hands and his feet were still wrapped up, stripped in linen. I mean, it'd be like, hey, dig him up, open the gate, and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Remove the dead end sign and let's make a new road. We're going to keep on going because he ain't really dead. He was just sleeping. It's Easter Sunday. We're getting rid of the dead ends. We're taking the grave clothes off. We're letting it go. We're going to keep on going. It don't matter what there is in our life. 
That's the reason the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the middle of this story, y'all, in the middle of John chapter 11, in the middle of the dead end of delay, in the middle of the dead end of discouragement, in the middle of the dead end of death, in the middle of the dead end of doubt, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who follows me will not hit a dead end. There are no inroads. The casket has no power over me. Because I am the resurrection and the life. Listen to me. I appreciate that golf clap. The resurrection is not an event. It's a person. You read this. I've been studying this all week. You know what it says? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You, in the Greek language, you can actually reverse those words and it's perfectly legal. And it says the resurrection is me. (laughs) <laughs> that the resurrection is not something that happened. The resurrection is something that is. Jesus is the resurrection. He is life. He is resurrection. He is when you bump into him, dead things come to life. And can you see Martha? Martha in her discouragement. I'm not, I'm, 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 Lord, you're too late. You're too late. Oh, oh, he's coming out of the grave. I guess he wasn't too late. Can you see old Thomas? When we're going to die, Lord, when we're going to He's coming out of the grave. Can you see that? Can you see Mary sitting in the house? Hey, Mary, you need to come up out the house. Lazarus is standing out in the yard. You've got to see this. And you can you see Lazarus? I mean, he's peaceful. He's at rest. And he hears somebody, Lazarus, what? Who in the world is that? Lungs start breathing again. He stands up. Who put this junk on me? I'm feeling pretty good. And he walks out of the grave because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I'm telling you, you showed up here this morning on Easter Sunday, and you look pretty, and you're great, but I'm telling you, I've been in enough situations, and I've preached long enough, and I've been in church long enough to know that He is a way maker. There are no dead ends to Him. There are no, there are no situations. I'm looking at one right now. If you'll allow me, Eric. Man, this brother sitting right here, we were there. They said it's a dead end. There's no hope. And Jesus said, you don't know nothing about dead ends. There's faith. And I'll raise them up. That's my body, man. And he brought life. We're believing for complete healing. Jesus' name. I know there's pain in this room. I know there's hurt in this room. I know it's Easter Sunday, and we're not supposed to get emotional, but you came to the wrong church. If you wanted a cantata, you should have woke up at 7 a.m. We didn't come for no cantata. We come to tell you that the Holy Ghost is here, and the Holy Ghost has power, and He is over all, and we stand in the name of Jesus. Woo! Amen. Amen. I'm about to get fired up. I love people who've been religious all their life. They say, that guy's on drugs. (laughs) I tell you what, I'm on a better drug than you've ever tried in your life. It's called the Holy Spirit of God. You not need to get a little bit in your veins. I wish I could take it and throw you some of it right now. Because some of you need it. This is the fourth time I've preached this. And I may not can stand it the fifth time. It may put me in my grave. I know that some of us are at dead ends. I know some of us are discouraged. I know some of us have doubt. I know some of us have pain. And I just showed up to tell you this morning and declare in the name of Jesus, there are no dead ends. Because hope is alive. Hope is alive today because Jesus is alive. He is the resurrection and he is the life. And today you might have come here because you're supposed to come to church on Easter, but God brought you here to change your life. I'm not trying to build a big church. I didn't come to preach to all of you. I came to preach to each of you. The Holy Spirit of God would move in you. And so today, I'm going to ask you to respond to him. Let's go back to our little card, if you would. Usually, we have a response time where I ask you to raise your hand and we pray together. We're not going to do that today. We're going to do something a little bit different. I want you to go to the A, B, C, and D on your card. And and even if you don't want to fill it out, 
Guys, listen to me. You're the, you're the ones that usually don't fill it out. I understand. I'm probably that guy, okay? But if you would humor me, just fake it for me, okay? Just pull it out and just like use your finger or something. That, because I know it's hard to trust people. And I don't know how to make you trust me except for ask you to trust me. But you're going to check one even if you don't check one. In your mind, you'll know which one you are. Before you check any of them, I want to go through all four of them, okay? The first letter is A. <clears throat> and A stands for, I already have a relationship. You can put that up on the screen. Relationship with Jesus. I already have a relationship with Jesus. B stands for, I'm beginning a real relationship with Jesus. C stands for, I'd like to consider it a bit more. Can I say something to you C people? You know, my favorite people in the church are C people. Because you still, got, you still got to figure it out. You're still figuring it out. I've always dreamed of a church where people could come, not have it all the answers, and not have to do anything, just figure it out. You're at a good place. And then D. D is, I never intend on making that decision. And we've already had some Ds this week. This week, this weekend, and I may have one in this service. But I want you to know, I want you to be man or woman enough to check that. And then, no, we're going to pray for you no matter what. <clears throat> as, you're, as you're deciding on that and you're, you're making on that, I, I, want you to, I want you to fill that out. And when you do, I just want you to kind of turn it over and leave it there. Maybe I got ahead of myself on my sermon. I want to share, I want to land the plane with this since our worship team is going to come up. In just a moment. And I can promise you, the wheels are down. The plane's, plane's landed. <laughs> Y'all know this preacher can't land a plane. Keeps going. I'm going to land it. But uh, I told you, uh, I've seen a lot of death. And man, unfortunately, walked through some of it with y'all. But uh, when, I was first, when I first started pastoring, I was a young pastor. And uh, had a beautiful lady who just loved me and Nicole. Um, and she was, she was just full of joy. And she loved it. She, she bought us a Cracker Barrel rocking chair for our, for our wedding gift. Come on. If you buy somebody a Cracker Barrel rocking chair for their wedding gift, you love them. You love them. <laughs> and she just, she was full of joy. She, she had a cackle laugh. Do y'all know anybody that cackles when they laugh? Just that. <laughs> you know, just bring joy to your heart, you know? And, uh, and she would cackle. She'd get to laughing. And uh, she got cancer four different times. And the fourth time she got it, <clears throat> they told her, they said, you go home, love your family, and that's it. That's it. And so she did, and I visited with her through that process. And if you've walked through that process, which I'm sure many of you have, it's a horrible process. Horrible. And they called me one night about 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and they said, uh, Pastor, they've called hospice in, and this, this is it. You need to come pray with the family. And uh, so I did. I come there, and I... Uh, they were all, all the family was there. And we walked back to that back room where she was and her son and her daughter-in-law and myself. And we pulled that door closed. And I was going to have prayer with her. And I was a young pastor and I was ready to pray. You know, do my pastorly duty, ready to pray. And so I, so I bow my head and I hear her whisper. She did. So I prayed. And after I prayed, it got a little bit louder. You know, and they have trouble with it. So I got down at her lips. I just loved her. She loved me. I could feel her breath on my ear. I could feel her breathing in and out. And she said, tell him to sit down. And I said, it sounded like she said, tell him to sit down. Let me listen again. Tell him to sit down. It's very clear. She told him to, she said, tell him to sit down. And I looked at her daughter-in-law and her daughter-in-law's eyes were just pouring, pouring she said when she was able she told me that Jesus comes and sits beside her bed every night and she told him to come and sit down and preacher she wants you to tell him to come and sit down what do you do at that moment I like to pass out I'll be honest with you I just sung amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see and in just a moment she went to be with the Lord. And there was the sweetest peace, the sweetest peace in that room. And I couldn't help but think all week long, 
that the same one that called Lazarus out of the grave is the same one who sit by that beautiful lady's bed and said, come on, sister, let's go home. And that same one is calling you today. Calling you today. Would you bow your heads with me?